Chilanga, Tata Chilanga, Boom Adede, Boom Adede, Cheche Kule, Cheche Kofisa, Kofisa Manga, Tata Chilanga, Boom Adede, Boom Adede. So, without much ado, I want to introduce somebody who is actually one of the very few Africans whose moral compass he has a true love. One of the very few Africans that you can truly call an intellectual, a giant. Somebody who has seen opportunities and left that opportunity in defense of his, of his fellow man. The only person I know who went after the government that actually hired him to do something. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Piero Lumumba um, was the director of the law school in Kenya and he was tapped to be the anti-corruption anti czar. But as it is in Africa, you, when they appoint you, you are supposed to go after every other person else. And you are supposed to just be like, show semblance of trying to do the job, but you are not supposed to do it. They found the wrong person. <laughs> Piero went after the very people who appointed him. <laughs> You can guess his fate, right? That it was fire, right? That, that is the best honor you can get from it. That is being fired by a corrupt and decadent regime. Being fired by a morally bankrupt regime. It's a badge of honor and not no shame, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to really stand up, rise up with me, and give the one that only Piero the moon a resounding hand of applause as he takes the stage and takes this. First, let me say how glad I am to be present with you this afternoon here in Germany. Uh, let me also thank the men and women who have taken time to organize this festival. I've been asked to share my thoughts with you on a subject that remains topical in the continent of Africa and it is framed differently. There are those who pose the question, can Africans solve their problems? Should they solve their problems? And there is no shortage of individual critics and armchair theorists who speak about the continent of Africa in different ways. Many times out of arrogance, sometimes out of ignorance. And they remind us when we have occasion to talk as we are, uh, that we have intellectualize the African problems for too long and therefore we should know. Uh, that we have uh, philosophized the African problems for too long and that we should know. And that we have uh, mentioned colonization and neocolonization too often and that we should know. And that we should look to the future. Yet experience tells us that in order to have a proper appreciation of the future, you have to understand the past. They forget that 
African countries only regained their independence a few years ago. In fact, Ghana, which was the first country to regain her independence, only celebrated her 60th birthday. And that in truth, therefore, the colonial agenda is still alive and well. They lose sight of the fact that the continent of Africa is the only continent which we still, particularly Western intellectuals, still refer to the continent of Africa in the terms of Anglophone, even when only 1% in a population of a country speak French, they say that they are uh, uh, Anglophone or Lusophone or Francophone. No other part of the world is referred to in those terms. It is even an indictment that as I address this assembly, I'm using a tongue that is alien to us. <laughs> and that those who have spoken to me also speak in an alien tongue. In other civilizations, including Germany, and no matter what happened, you still teach your children in your language. You still celebrate your culture. The African intellectual still is made to believe that he or she is intellectually grounded when they speak in perfect French grammar or perfect German grammar or perfect English grammar and that they are intelligent when they speak in a tongue other than their own. Yes. That is the predicament in which we find ourselves. And therefore, when we talk about Africans solving their African problem, it is critical that we must ask ourselves what is the problem and how can that problem be tackled. You know, many times when I travel across Africa and agonize about us, I ask myself the foundational question. What must have been in the mind of the European powers? in 1884 when they sat in Berlin, what was in their mind? When they sat there and they passed out another continent where over 3,000 languages are spoken and they divided that continent arbitrarily into spheres of influence. In my mind, it must have been, and I stand to be corrected and contradicted, that they had identified a hunting ground, and they wanted to hunt from that ground without conflict. Therefore, the English had their share, which they now still proudly refer to as Anglophone, and after we regained our independence for some reason, we were persuaded to create the Commonwealth of former colonies. And it is never lost on me that the United States of America is not a part of the Commonwealth. <laughs> and those who are colonized no longer period. The French had their own sphere of influence. And after they were kicked out of Africa, they cleverly created an organization of French-speaking countries. In other words, the colonial project is alive and well under different guise. The Portuguese were there, and they too carved out their own spheres of influence. And if you look at the former Portuguese colonies, the umbilical cord is still intact. The neo-colonial project is alive and well. The Germans were there, but they were kicked out. But there are remnants of them in different parts of Africa with some very subterranean strength. 
which we don't talk about, but which we must now talk about in order not to be politically correct. Because the solution to a problem requires that there is proper diagnosis. Without proper diagnosis, you will use Panadol to try and treat cancer with little success or no effect at all. We know that the apartheid regime was alive and well until 1994 and that the vestiges of that regime are still troubling South Africa today. So that is the Africa that we are talking about. There were the Italians, the Spaniards were there in the little sliver of land that we call Equatorial Guinea and in Saharawi. That is the Africa that we have today. It is an Africa that is still burdened in many ways. You know, many times, including this time, when I want to travel, I've got to go to a bank in my country and ask that my local currency be converted into hard currency. <laughs> and hard currency means the euro. Hard currency means the pound sterling. Hard currency means the American dollar. Hard currency does not include the Ghanaian CD, it does not. It does not include the Kenyan shilling, it does not. In other words, Africa still finds herself in an environment where the economies that we run are shadow economies which can be collapsed and manipulated by external forces. That is how I explain Zimbabwe. That is how I explain many other countries. So that when we talk about Africa, solving our own problems, I repeat ad nauseum that it is incumbent upon us to diagnose what our problem is. Our problem is that we have never identified our problem. Yeah. Until the day that we identify our problem, we will be in a position to identify those problems. Those who say that we must not go back to history are misguided. Every civilization goes back to history. Because if you understand your history, you are better able to appreciate your circumstances and your future. You know, when I go back to our African history and I listen to the thoughts of some of the founding fathers of Africa in 1960s. And I remember very specifically the year 1963, in the month of May, when the 32 leaders of the then independent countries gathered in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, each one of them, each one of them, including Amadou Ahijo of Cameroon. Ah. It was as if the Holy Spirit had descended upon them. The clarity and the vision and the fact, the passion with which they appreciated the African problem was as refreshing as it was enlightened. They were able to appreciate that Africans had to decolonize their minds because it is very easy to say that you are independent but the mind is the standard of the man. Martin Luther King Jr. was right. The mind is the standard of the man. If your mind is still colonized, we can say you are free but you are not free at all. They were able to appreciate that when we decolonize our mind, we will be able to appreciate 
that the colonial project was a project that would remain alive and well and that there are those who actually believe that the continued subjugation and confusion in Africa is for their benefit. They were able to see that. And they had an antidote. Many prescribed it. I remember, courtesy of history, the president of Central African Republic, David Dako, saying, not in so many words, but in effect, he said, that it is only through African unity that my little country will be immunized from the machinations of the erstwhile colonizer of France. He said, and he was passionate, and he was believable. Senegal's Leopold Sedar Senghor was as clear as in February of Côte d'Ivoire. Their clarity was amazing. But the pierce the resistance, as the French would say with pride, was the speech by Ghana's Kwame Nukuruma. He, with a sense of urgency, told the Africans present on that day that if Upon attaining this thing we call independence, we do not have a new African man, and he must have meant also a new African woman. And he must have meant that that new African man and woman must be somebody who had a changed mind. Then African independence would be in vain. He reminded his audience and urged the audience on that day that we must live here with a united Africa. And we must live here with a united Africa, with a single currency, with a single army. Kwame Nukuruma was not vain nor naive. When he talked about unity and peace, he did not mean the peace of the graveyard. No, not the unanimity of the graveyard. He meant an engagement of African peoples where there would be mutual benefit. And he appreciated, among other things, that in order to move Africa forward, we should de-emphasize the things that divide us and emphasize the things that unite us. That spirit was not embraced by many of his compatriots on that day. And we ended up with a loose union called the Organization of African Union, which some people said had blunt teeth but I even doubt if it had teeth at all. <laughs> we have subsequently, of course, tried to empower the organization by creating the African Union, but the significance and the import of what happened in 1963 was the realization that Africans had to solve their problems by themselves. And the words that were spoken over 50 years ago are as relevant today as when they were spoken. The misguided belief by Africans that somebody will come to the continent of Africa and rescue the continent of Africa can only be what it is, misguided belief. It is that Nigeria's Chinua Achebe who described it as the cargo cult mentality, the belief by people that without any effort on their part, somebody who has received divine inspiration and guidance will come and like Moses parted the Red Sea will say, hunger disappear and hunger disappears, poverty disappear and poverty disappears. Nothing is going to happen like that. We've got to lift up ourselves by our bootstraps but we must remember that even our boots were taken so that when we are told to lift ourselves by our bootstraps we don't even have boots sometimes we are told that we've got to tighten our belt but we don't even have belts so the first thing is that we must recognize what is it that we have nobody can deny that Africa is a rich continent. Nobody can deny. Nobody. nobody. There is diamond, there is gold, there is all these things. 
But gold and mined is useless. Diamond and mined and unrefined is useless. Flowers and girls that are useless. We must apply some effort and some labor. You know, international relations, and I'm not an expert in it, sometimes teaches me many lessons. When I look at the structure of the world power, I look at the organization, or rather the United Nations organization founded in San Francisco in 1945, and they created what is called the permanent members of the United Nations. No African country was independent save Ethiopia and Liberia at the time of the founding of the United Nations organization in San Francisco. And then I look at the structure of the United Nations today. Africa has the largest majority of countries. African countries can go to New York and they can vote all they want. And once they are voted, if the French don't like it, one French vote neutralizes all the votes. Yeah. By something that they describe as a veto vote. Whenever I look at that situation, it tells us that we are not at the dinner table. Or if we are, we are not diners. We are waiters, at the very best. Or we are food to be consumed at the very worst. That is the, the, the closest we get to the dinner table. And that is not the only thing that I look at. When the G7 meet, the G7, these are the nations that are richest on earth. When they meet occasionally, when there is divine providence, they invite one or two African leaders. And after they have taken the photograph at the opening, the African leaders are then asked, you may now go. We are now going to discuss real things. And real things are discussed in the absence of the continent of Africa with over 1.5 billion human beings. That is before a proper sense has been taken. That is the Africa that we are talking about. Then you have a meeting of the G20. That is, they are now trying to incorporate a few. Even then, Africa is very poorly represented. There is an African saying that you cannot be shaped in your absence. <laughs> Africa is always absent, and yet it is asking to have a haircut. How can you have a haircut in your absence? <laughs> I hold the view that we have the intellectual wherewithal, that we have the capacity, but we must demonstrate the capacity. It is not at conferences such as this that we make pronouncement. Our words must be wedded with our deeds. If our words are not wedded with our deeds, then we can pontificate all we want. We can lecture all we want. We can hold workshops and symposia and festivals all we want. But I'm telling you, for those of you who are Christian, Christ will come and will still be pontificating and holding symposia to his surprise and disgust. <laughs> so we were here today posing the question, what solution must we have to African problems? We can't. And whenever Africans have tried to do things and to have solutions to their problems, they have succeeded. Look at the entire process of decolonization. It was animated by Africans, wherever they were. Whether it was Marcus Garvey in, in, in Jamaica, or George Padmore, or W.E.B. Du Bois, or other Africans who are in the diaspora, the connectivity was amazing, and there were, there were no jets. The modes of travel were difficult, but there is something that told them that when we unite, and we unite with a purpose, then we can realize what we want and desire. And we decolonize Africa. 
in South Africa, when the apartheid regime refused to leave, it was not the effort of Europe and America that brought the camels back. No, it was not. It was the young men and women in Sharpeville in 1960 and the young boys in Soweto in 1976 that broke the camels back. Whenever Africa has wanted to achieve something and wanted it bad enough, it has always achieved. And we can see that whenever Africa has focused on certain things, it has realized those things. Those of you who are students of African history and African geography and African politics will see that when our countries regained independence, the very first few years, Africa was realizing immeasurable growth, whether it was in the area of infrastructure or in the area of education, Africans were achieving great things. We were disrupted. But it is a demonstration that we can do things for ourselves. That does not mean that we will not be helped by our friends of goodwill. Our friends of goodwill will if they want to, but history demonstrates and has demonstrated times without number. Carter G. Woodson once said in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, that the relationship between peoples must not be the relationship between a horse and the rider. The tragedy of Africa today is that when we relate with other civilizations, we relate as if we are the horse to be beaten along and others are the riders to guide us where they will. We must reverse the relationship and participate in a more meaningful way. And the world, as I understand it, is still very right. Charles Darwin, if I'm right in remembering who the one who said this, but the world is still about survival of the fittest and the dying of the least suitable. Don't be deluded. Everybody and every civilization does what is in their best interest. And I do not begrudge civilizations when they do what is in their best interest. If Africans choose to do what is not in our best interest, what will betide you? War betide you, we must be able to identify what is best for us. And today, when I look at Africa, what do I see without being fatalistic? I see a continent that is capable of rising, a continent that is in fact rising. But let me tell you also, Africa must tell her story. I do not know, you know, those who do not know Africa, even when they are citing proverbs, they say, this is an African proverb. No, Africa has 3,000 plus nations. But amongst the many African nations, there is a say that unless the lands have their historians, it is the exploit of the hunter that will be written and talked about and not the bravery of the lion. Africa must tell her story. You know, you are typical African who has gone to school and who is exposed that does not sleep for two nights when they are interviewed by CNN. And they are quick to say, um, I was interviewed by the CNN. They don't tell you that CNN will repeat one item of news for 30 times in 24 hours. That they don't tell you. When they are German speakers, they'll say, I've been uh, interviewed by Radio Dosheva. And that is a point of bragging. When they have been interviewed by the French television, they are proud about it. <laughs> But those media houses were created, among other things, to tell the story of Germany from a German perspective. Yes. CNN to tell the story of America from an American perspective. Al Jazeera to tell the story of the Arabs from an Arab perspective. Where is the media house that tells the story of Africa from an African perspective? SCBC! 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 There we are! SCBC! SCBC! There we go! And SCBC 
SCBC from South Africa tries. I know. SCBC. And SBC I'm told tries, but we are not trying hard enough. Because if you are trying hard enough, I would have known about you. There you go. But now that I know about you, I'll talk about you. children are dying and they are dying in certain areas yes. but there are good things they never tell you yes. that the Ethiopians have recently built an electric train from Djibouti <laughs> they never tell you that they never tell you that Kenya has one of the largest wind farms in the world they never tell yes. you that they never tell you that Morocco has one of the largest solar farms in the world yes. But the Moroccans must make a decision whether the Africans, when it is convenient, because sometimes yes, 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 they are the Africans. So the Moroccans who are here decide are you Africans or you are not? Because you cannot be present in two different places at the same time. So we want clarity from Morocco. We can see clarity from Algeria. We can see clarity from Egypt. I'm talking about the Maghreb. We want clarity so that when we are talking about Africa, we are clear who is with us and who is not with us. But the point that I'm making is that there is an Africa that is doing well. Go to Ghana now. You may have faults and no system is perfect, but you are beginning to see things. Yes. Go to South Africa, they may have their problems, but one can see things. Go to Tanzania, you are seeing things. Even in terms of dispute resolution, for nearly 20 years, the Ethiopians and their Eritreans were not seeing eye to eye. It did not need a mediator from Europe or the United States. <laughs> And within six months, there is peace that is restored. Only yesterday, we saw the successful signing of the peace between Frelimo and Renamo in Mozambique. In other words, we are beginning to see progress, Central African Republic. But there are still a few areas that must make us unhappy as Africa. And once again, I hold the view that it is incumbent upon us to find solutions. Sudan is restless. You know, we thought in the year 2011 that when Sudan was divided and we had the South and the Sudan separated, it would solve the problem. Several years down the line, there is a problem in Sudan and in South Sudan. Yet I believe that if we sit and our leaders, or so-called political leaders sit in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and determined to solve those problems, we can find a solution. We can find a solution. And it gladdens my heart that my good brother from Ethiopia is here. It is not lost on me that your Prime Minister has been shuttling from Khartoum to Juba to Addis Ababa in an attempt to create peace. I hope that he will be a successful midwife. And he needs to be supported in that regard. I'm mentioning these problems in order for us to recognize and agree with my brother, Dr. Folefa, that if the foot is not comfortable, it creates discomfort to the entire body. Yes. And that is what brings me to the pro the, to Ambazonia. Yeah. And you know, you Ambazonians must also have clarity. Yes. Sometimes you are Southern Cameroons. Sometimes you are Ambazonians. Choose you now how you want to be referred to. Ambazonia. Ambazonia. 
And if it is Ambazonian, some say that there is something in a name. How many of you had the privilege and honor of watching Alex Haley's roots? And if you did, you remember one of the very first tasks of breaking down Kunta Kinte was to beat him down so that he becomes Toby. He accepted the name Toby, but the spirit of Kunta Kinte never died. So from today, henceforth, we will only refer to Ambazonia with the appendage Southern Cameroon for historical reason. But going forward, we are talking about a segment of what is now known as the Cameroon, but which is correctly Ambazonia. Yeah. Thank you. It brings me to the question. I have also been asked on different occasions, how can you talk of Pan-Africanism? And yet, even dare suggest that a people within the African continent cannot seek self-determination. And in my view, they are not mutually exclusive. You know, many of you here are parents, and you love your children, and you love them so much, and you do not want to be separated from them. But as they grow old, when they attain the age of 18, particularly here in Europe, you begin to show them signs that the time has come, that if our love is to remain strengthened, you must look for your own apartment. <laughs> it is not an expansion, and if they remain in the residence, they must take up some of the bills, pay this electricity or pay for water. Sometimes relationships are strengthened when people are separated and they do certain things by themselves. Oh, yeah. When I hear the people, the oppressed people of Ambazonia say, is that we were deluded in 1960s, and they were. Those of you who are students of history will appreciate this. They were told that this would be the, this would be the terms of engagement. Those terms of engagement have been honored in breach. And what we want to hear, therefore, is that the people of Ambazonia are helped by their African brethren to, number one, stop the creeping genocide that is taking place in that part of the world. It saddens me that the African Union has never called an emergency meeting to discuss the issue of Ambazonia. It saddens one. But that once again is a weakness. It is a weakness because for some reason, sometimes we too believe that Europe will solve our problems. Europe has no business solving our problems. Europe has many problems which they had better be solving. And this assumption that Europe is going to come and solve our problems is completely misguided. In fact, One day, we need an African meeting, an African Union meeting with only three agenda items. Agenda item number one, what is wrong with us? <laughs> that is the only item that we discuss for one week, what is wrong with us? That not because for anything, because we are punching below our weight. Yes. Not that we are not doing certain things, but Africa punches below her weight. Politically, economically, and otherwise, we are punching below our weight. You know, yesterday, I saw a, an interview of a young African in Libya and this young African was a woman who had been raped she had been enslaved and yet she was saying that if she has an opportunity she'll still want to cross the Mediterranean to come to Europe Why would I want to come to Europe? 
It must be that the conditions at home are so bad. And yet somehow, our leaders see these and they are moved and untouched. They must have had some stone. As I speak to you now, there are over 60,000 Africans in slavery, or part of slavery, in Libya. In slavery, modern day slavery. And we don't speak about it. We don't talk about the conditions that made them leave their countries. Because in order to leave West Africa, you've got to grapple with the Sahara. And after the Sahara, you've got to grapple with the Mediterranean Sea. And after you've crossed the Mediterranean Sea, the Italian Prime Minister does not want you to get into Europe. And even other Europeans are accepting you grudgingly. And except for very few, many of them who get into Europe will go into menial jobs. Of course, there is a cadre of many Africans who have come to Europe and are well trained and are doing great things as doctors and engineers. They are building a continent which is already built. It is Africa that needs them, but Africa must need an environment. You know, two years ago, I met a young lady doctor from Zimbabwe in Austria. And I was pontificating, pretending to know it all and telling her, why don't you go home to Zimbabwe? And this was a response to me. When I left Zimbabwe, my salary was the equivalent of five dollars a month. My children have got to go to school. If you are me, would you go back? I told her I would not. Because the first instinct of a human being is self-preservation. So what must happen is that there must be an environment that is created by our countries and we must participate in the creation of that environment. Don't be deluded that somebody will create it. And that is why it gladdens me to see and to be present in a festival such as this. Because this kind of festival is celebrating the potential of Africans, what we can do. But we can do better. But remember, my thesis is that we still continue to punch below our weight. My good friend, Dr. Folefark, said that the day he acquired the almighty American passport, he moves with let, without let and hindrance. Those of you who have the American passport, you can go to virtually any country. Because there is no fear that you will remain in those countries. Those of you who have the European passport, the German passport, you can go to any country. But you take one of these poor African countries and their passports and the number of questions that you are asked when you arrive at a border post, including who your grandfather was, they ask. <laughs> We are continuing to punch below our weight politically. The day we are powerful, the world will respect us. Today I come to the airport here in Stuttgart and the signage is also in Chinese. The Chinese have arrived and the world cannot ignore them. You go to any country today, good dining means Chinese food, among other things. Good dining means that you must eat with chopsticks. That is, when you arrive in the world and you arrive with a bang and politically you are strong and economically you are strong, even your enemies begin to refer to you in flattering ways. <laughs> Africa must attain, and the Chinese did it by stealth and by working hard and by identifying what they want and they have worked at it, you cannot ignore them. We too can find ourselves in such a situation. But we must work at it. 
We can work at it. And that is why when I look at Africa today and I see the West Africans are beginning to grapple with a currency called the eco, it gladdens my heart. Why? Because those are baby steps toward the realization of a, of a larger goal. Because one day, we may have a currency called the Afro, and then as we move to the Afro, it will become hard currency. Because none of your currencies are hard, they are useless. Once you leave your border, our currencies are useless. People wonder whether they are things that children use in playing Monopoly. <laughs> but the day we have Afro, which is a continental currency that is backed by goods and services. Because the African economy GDP last year was just about three trillion. One billion, 1.3 billion of us. The total goods that we produced last year is less than Germany. The German GDP is possibly anything between four and five trillion dollars. How can it be? Little Germany. What is it that they are doing that we are not doing? There must be something, and you who are here, who are engineers, copy what they are doing and bring it back home. That is what we can learn from them. They have some of the best schools in engineering. Learn and bring it home. And you don't have to be physically home to bring it home. Perhaps you who are here are too old to be useful. But your children and children's children must be tutored in such a manner that they normally look to what permit me to call their spiritual and political true north. They must remember Mother Africa. Because it is only then that we will then meet at a conference of civilization. It can be done. But it's not going to be easy. It is not for the faint-hearted. Even when we say these things, it is not that we are naive. We are not saying that they are going to happen tomorrow. We are not saying that it will happen, that they will not be impeded. They will be. Africa can solve her problems. You know, these boundaries that we have, they never worry me. Because they can be administrative. All these boundaries we have in Africa with 54, 55 countries, depending on which country you are not counting. Because <laughs> the Moroccans don't want us to count Sahara. And the Cameroon does not want us to count Ambazonia, but I am counting it. And when we count it, it is not anti-Africa. These are just boundaries. And those of you who live in the European Union know how easy it is to move across Europe. Because the boundaries are there for administration and other things, but the ease with which you now transact, if you ask the Greeks what Europe has done to them, I'm sure that if they are sincere, they'll tell you, they have done great things to us. If you ask the Portuguese what Europe has done to them, they will tell you it is a great thing. If you ask the Spaniards, forget this atavistic jingoism, which they may relapse into occasionally in order to say we are this. That is what we are saying African Union will do to the rest of us. So you can be Amazonian all you want, you can be Tanzanian all you want, you can be Senegalese all you want, but we are talking about Africa. And I look forward to the day when we also have a lingua franca. Oh, and it appears to me that Kiswahili is beginning to acquire that lingua franca character. It can be done, because right now Kiswahili has no less than 300 speakers. So I look forward to the day when we go into an international conference and we have interpreters simultaneous and we are waxing eloquent in Kiswahili as it is now. Whatever we Africans are saying, the English can hear all of it. We cannot backbite them. We must have 
a language in which we can backbite them and in which we can say certain things that they do not understand, citing the proverbs and idioms that they cannot understand. Pigeon. 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 Oh, yeah. You know, as I conclude, <laughs> whenever I travel across Africa, and now I must say this because I'm in, in, I'm in Germany, and they are very proud civilization, the Germans. Even when there are no more than 2,000 of them in a country, they'll always have a German school. Yes. So that their children can be translocated from their motherland. But they still retain their Germanness. It is by being good Germans that the Germans become good Europeans. Yes, right. It is not, you must first, you must be a good Tanzanian to become a good African. Very good. You must be a good Amazonian to become a good African. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I think that that is why when you go to any of these countries, you find something, all of them, the British Cultural Center. Yes. In Nigeria, British Cultural Center. Yeah. The Gauta Institute in Nairobi, King. Yes. The French Cultural Center. But I come here. Oh. There, is no there is not a single African country with a cultural center except this festival, yes. which is trying to mimic a cultural center. <laughs> I'm saying that as civilization such as Ethiopia could be pioneering. And to this end, you must be celebrated. You travel around the world and you see an Ethiopian restaurant. Yes. And you know that there is injera that is being eaten there. And you know that there is coffee. Yes. So in a nutshell, I can talk until the cows come home. <laughs> but there is no wisdom because there are no cows and there is no home here. So I could talk forever. But what I believe is that we Africans have the solution to the problem that we have. Yes. But let us also not beat ourselves too much. As I travel across Africa, and I travel across Africa enough to know that there are good things happening in Africa. Right. Yes. I go to Kigali, Rwanda, after the genocide in 1994, oh, yeah. and I see certain things that I say that there are good things happening in Africa. Yes, right. There may be problems here and there, and there is no shortage of people who will criticize, but critics sometimes are useful only to the extent that they criticize, but if they are not constructive. Good things happening in Kigali, Rwanda. I go down to Namibia and they may talk about unemployment to Botswana, but there are good things happening. You come to my own country, Kenya, there are good things happening, although we make grumble here and there. You go to Tanzania, there are good things happening. In other words, there I can begin to see baby steps. It is not going to be perfect. Even in heaven, there was no perfection. That's why Satan left. <laughs> now, if the divinity itself did not know perfection and certain angels rebelled, who are we not to have certain incapacities? And that is why, therefore, we need our friends of goodwill. So that when I see us collaborating and I see people from different civilizations, I can only appreciate that what is happening today here is a cross-fertilization and a cross-pollination of ideas. And when they are cross-pollinated and cross-fertilized, the product can only be good. Africa must be great, and Africa can be great, and Africa will be great. God bless you. One more round of appreciation. Speeches <laughs> like this, you will pay so much money to listen to people like this. But um, this is he who he is, just coming to give us for 
free. Just so that if Prof can do this for free, what should we do for Africa? We should go there and help. Because one of the problems is you never, we as the civil society, don't actually do what we are supposed to do. Thank you, thank you. And on behalf of um, Pelu Lumumba, I want to thank you people immensely for coming here to uh, listen to him and we hope you get something back. Thank you. I did it. 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 I did it.